Hello, people of God. I greet you in the name of Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord of all. As we enter into worship on this Sunday before the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, I am reminded of that beautiful place in the book of Revelation that gives us a glimpse of worship in heaven. In chapter 7, verse 9, the book of Revelation says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the Lamb. The Apostle John, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was given a vision of the diversity of humanity worshiping the Lord. And oh, how we need to recover that vision in our day. One of our core values as a church is diversity. We believe, we believe that God has called us to be a multi-ethnic, intercultural family of Jesus followers. We believe that God has called us to live out this value of diversity in our own lives beyond the church building. As we enter into worship today, we are mindful of the division and racism and violence in the country. We have been watching the horrifying and disturbing images on the news. And so this time of worship, this time of worship, is not religious escapism. We are not, we're not burying our heads in some holy sand pretending as if we don't see what's happening in the country right now. No, this time of worship is about honoring the Lord. It's about honoring the Lord, honoring the Lord who by his cross and resurrection is taking us to that great day of unity and peace around the throne. This time of worship is about empowerment. It's about empowerment. It's about your empowerment to be salt and light in this world. It's about your empowerment to be God's courageous instrument of racial reconciliation and justice and peace. Let's pray together. God of love, truth, justice, and mercy. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that you are indeed at work in the world. Even though there are powers and principalities, systems and structures spreading racism and division through violence and deception, we celebrate your work in and among us. We are grateful that you are at work bringing people together in your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this day that we might worship you well. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we might hear your word this day. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we might increasingly become that multicultural, multi-ethnic, intercultural family of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we, like our brother Martin Luther King Jr., might courageously live out your call to justice and nonviolence and reconciliation, even at the cost of our own comfort. God, we celebrate this day the victory and salvation won for us in Jesus Christ. And we look forward to that great day when all your people, all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages will be gathered around your throne, all your children together around your throne in worship. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let us worship God.
Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our soul shall rise to Martin Luther King Jr. said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Giving your tithes and offerings is a good and right thing to do before the Lord. And it is also symbolic. Giving your tithes and offerings is symbolic of giving your whole life in service to the Lord. And understand, understand it's not about the size of the gift. It's not about the size of the gift. Really, it's, it's not. It's about the God to whom you give. What is true about both your life and your offering is that when surrendered to God, God will use it for His mighty, marvelous purpose. No matter how small, no matter how insignificant it may seem to us, God will use it for His mighty work. Moses had a wooden staff, a, just a plain, ordinary wooden staff, but when surrendered 
to God, when he surrendered his life to the purpose and mission of God, God used that plain wooden staff to help free Israel from Egypt. The disciples had five loaves of bread, just five loaves of bread and two fish. But when surrendered to Jesus, when placed in the hands of Jesus, those five loaves of bread, those two fish were used to feed more than 5,000 people. No matter the size of your gift, God will use your gift. God will use your life of service for his great and mighty purpose. So as you give your tithes and offerings this week, give knowing that it is symbolic of giving your whole life in service to the Lord. You may mail your tithes and offerings to the church, or you may give online at our website, deritaprez.org. May the Lord continue to bless you. Good morning, Saints of the Grove. I am really happy to be here with you right now and also really happy to welcome the folks at Derrida Presbyterian Church who are joining us for this part of our worship service today. I invite all of us um, to open our hearts, our minds to God's word for us in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Hear these words of scripture. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. This is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It's not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. And the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Here at the Grove, as a community, January isn't a time for new resolutions. It's a time for recommitment to our mission as a congregation, inviting all to serve and come alive in Christ. Last week, in the aftermath of a failed coup in our nation's capital, we talked about what it means to invite all. And we looked at the time Jesus met a Samaritan woman at a well and offered her the living water of salvation and invited her into the story of redemption that God was writing through him in the world. Even though she was the daughter of the enemy of his people, even though she represented a religious, political, ethnic threat, 
that was only on earth. In the kingdom of God that was invading the earth, she was one more sinner whose redemption made the angels sing. And once she was invited in, she immediately became an inviter. And suddenly, all kinds of Samaritans were worshiping and proclaiming Jesus as Messiah and worshiping God in spirit and truth as a sign of the realm. And it was uncomfortable and an unwelcome development for Jesus' first disciples. But it wouldn't be the last time that Jesus' ministry would confuse them even offend them. In fact, if the grace and call of Jesus Christ doesn't confuse and offend you fairly regularly, if you don't frequently find yourself troubled by things Jesus does and says, then there's a very good chance that you're actually worshiping your own self with Jesus' name. So after last week, a lot of you reached out to me and said, Okay, okay, we get it. All means all. And the people that we hate and fear are not hated and feared by God. And we understand that all of us leave our old stories and our old identities behind to step into a new story and a new identity in Christ. But how, like how do we invite people? And there's only one answer, church serving. We invite people to share this life story that we have with Jesus and our story is we're following him so we do what he asks us to do, what he did, and what he did was serve. The Son of Man came not to be served but to serve. And if we do that, if we serve like Jesus served, not as the culture serves. If we serve like Jesus served, then our life together is going to be as much of a scandal, as much of a holy spectacle. Our life together is going to attract as much attention, good attention and bad attention, as Jesus' own life did. So how did Jesus serve? We turn to this story and we find it in the Gospel of Matthew, but you'll find it in all four Gospels. Jesus feeds a whole bunch of people. And I want us to look really carefully at who and how and when and where and why he served. Because we want to serve people like Jesus did. Because serving people, even feeding people in and of themselves, is not what we're about. We want to serve through and in the power of Christ. Because there are lots of other ways and reasons to serve. And you see one of them in this same chapter in Matthew. In the 14th chapter, we find two stories of dinner parties. It's a story of two famous events. And at both of these events, people are served. At both of these events, people get fed. And it's not a coincidence that these two stories lie side by side, not just in Matthew, but in every gospel. The first party is thrown by King Herod, and Jesus's party is in direct response to Herod. We're supposed to notice both parties, and we're supposed to compare them. And it is important to see that Jesus and Herod are both kings, both with authority, but they are ruling in very different kingdoms, but they're both legitimate in their realms. And so King Herod was doing what kings do. He had a royal dinner party. It happened to be a banquet celebrating his own birth. And Matthew doesn't tell us who was there, but we can assume that the guest list would have been similar. The customs around that feast would have been similar to all the other royal feasts in that day. So powerful people were reclining around lavish banquet tables and there was an abundance of rich food and drink. But not everybody in the room was eating. The powerful people were eating and the less powerful people were serving and the very least powerful people were locked away in prison out of sight. But they were not out of mind. 
Herod, confusingly, was married to a woman named Herodias. And even more confusingly, Herodias was the former wife of Herod's own brother, Philip. And in Jewish law, to marry your brother's light, wife while your brother is still alive, it's a sin before God. And even now, it is rarely a healthy family systems move. And John the Baptist, when he blazes into public life, he's calling everyone to repentance. And he's not just telling the poor and powerless to repent and turn, return to God. He's also calling the powerful, the people whose lives were envied, the people who were represented as those who were living in accordance to God's law. He's calling them to repentance and to return to God's law too. So the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the king. The king who claimed to rule in the name of God, but he openly defied God's law when it came to matrimony. And matrimony had been the downfall of many a Jewish king. So Herod had John arrested because John was drawing a crowd and it was making everybody nervous and his movement was a threat. But still Herod, he had kind of a soft spot for the prophet and so he would go to visit him in prison because the word of God draws people in even as it reveals sin. So John would go down to prison and listen, I'm mean, sorry, Herod would go down to prison and listen to John talk and John was saying to him, hey, you cannot be married to your brother's wife. And Herodias hated, hated John because he was calling her out specifically. And be fair about this. If John had convinced Herod to renounce the marriage, on the other side of that, Herod would have still been king. He could have certainly easily found another wife, but Herodias would have been ruined. She could hardly have gone back to her first marriage. Her whole life depends on John shutting up. So when her daughter, her young daughter, who's no older than Mary when she uh, became pregnant with Jesus, when her young daughter is invited to dance at the king's birthday banquet, she charms King Herod so much that he makes a vow in front of all of his guests. And his vow is that he will give this young girl anything she asks for. And his vow is actually a boast. Because what he's doing is saying, I am a king with enough power that I can give someone whatever they want. So she goes to her mom and her mom says, here's what we want, John dead. And so Salome goes to Herod and asks for the prophet's head on a platter because it's a banquet. And Matthew tells us that, that Herod didn't want to do it, but he had boasted in front of everyone that he could do anything, would do anything, and he couldn't go back on his vow. He knew that everyone he had invited to this banquet was vying for his seat. He knew that if he denied her request, he was confessing weakness and inviting insurrection. He could not defy the crowd around him. He had to be the king they wanted and expected or they would find someone else. So that's how it comes to be that the only thing we read about being served at the king's banquet is death. The dismembered head of God's anointed on a platter. And he died for no reason at all. And John's disciples come to retrieve their master's body and to honor it with burial customs. And then they go and they tell Jesus what happened. And Jesus please don't miss this. He is overwhelmed. His heart is full of anguish because this man was his cousin. This man was his friend. This man was his forerunner in ministry. Jesus's heart is full of pain at seeing the brutality of the people he had come to rescue. And his heart is full of knowledge because he knows that it is just a matter of time before what happened to John is going to happen to him. So Jesus withdraws to a secluded place to feel his feelings, to be alone with his pain and anger and grief and fear because he can't just carry on 
like nothing happened. He has to stop the ministry he's doing and get on a boat and get away quickly. But the crowd that he's been healing is so desperate that they find out where he's going and they follow him on foot. And so before he's even started processing or healing, he's not done grieving or praying, they find him before he even steps out of his getaway boat, they are there. And Jesus' own anguish and pain and grief, it's so real, but it doesn't blind him to their pain. He sees the crowd and their desperation for healing and he has compassion for them and he begins to heal them. And it's always dangerous to use Jesus as a model for handling human emotions because Jesus is fully human, but he's also fully divine. But it's important in this season where so many of us are struggling with grief and trying to learn how to carry it and integrate it into our lives. It's so important to pause for a minute and just notice that Jesus here is embodying two very different, but very real and healthy and legitimate ways to begin to heal from grief. The first is to withdraw, and there's no shame in that. And the other is to do something very beautiful in response to your pain. And Jesus did both of those things. So we probably should allow the Holy Spirit to lead us to do both things as well. Anyway, Jesus um, gets out of the boat and he begins to heal them and he heals them all day long until the disciples come up and they interrupt him and they say, Jesus, it's getting dark and we're out here and it's the middle of nowhere and these people, they need to eat. And it's going to take them a while to walk to any kind of village where they can get some food. So you need to send them away right now so they're not traveling hungry in the dark. And don't diss the disciples here. They're not being callow or mean. They're really thinking about what's best for the crowd. They're seeing a problem and they're trying to prevent it. And they are speaking to Jesus uh, with compassion and their solution is reasonable and realistic. And Jesus, who didn't invite any of these people to what was supposed to be his retreat to grieve, but he looks at that crowd and he says, they don't need to go away. If you can see that they need to eat, then you give them something to eat. And the disciples say again, quite reasonably to Jesus, Jesus, we, we only have five loaves and two fish. And that's not even enough for the 13 of us, much less the thousands and thousands of them. We only have five loaves and two fish, Jesus. And Jesus says, great, give it to me. Jesus asks them for everything that they have. And don't you dare make fun of these disciples because they are hungry in the middle of nowhere too. And they've left their whole lives and their livelihood behind to follow Jesus. And now Jesus is asking them for everything they have left so he can give it away to strangers. And they give it to him. They came to Jesus because they saw the crowd was hungry and they cared. And so they knew Jesus would care. And they came to him with a reasonable and compassionate solution. The plan was to send the crowd away so the crowd could feed themselves. The plan was to then build a fire and split the seven pieces of food 13 ways. And Jesus says, these people don't have to leave here to be fed. Give me what you have so I can give it to them. Jesus isn't pulling out his own secret holy stash of bread. He asks his followers for the little they have left so that he can give it away. And don't Let's not kill ourselves, kid ourselves, church. He asks the very same thing of us. He isn't interested in our reasonable plans or our agendas either. Give me what you have, even when it's not enough, even when it's all you have left. And Jesus takes what they give him, and he doesn't even thank them for it. He takes it, and then he invites all the people to sit down. And with the bread and the fish in his hands, he looks first up to God and he gives thanks to God because Jesus is always doing theology 
And so he's reminding everyone there, those who are about to receive and those who think that they gave something, he's reminding everyone there that the real source, the real giver is God. So he doesn't thank the disciples for their faith or their trust or their generosity. He thanks God, who is the real giver of the gift. He takes it. He looks up to give thanks to God. And immediately he breaks it. Because what we give back to God is always changed and often in ways that appear broken to us. He breaks it and then he gives the pieces to the disciples, not for them to eat, but for them to give away. And the disciples give bread to everyone who is there. Everyone who came looking for something, they got some of the disciples' bread. And everyone was served. And everyone ate. And everyone had enough. Everyone had enough. And that is a miracle. In that day, in that place and time among people desperate enough to race into the wilderness to find Jesus, in that crowd, hunger was omnipresent as heartbeats. Being hungry was how you knew you were still alive. These were subsistence farmers and fishermen, and they were taxed so heavily by their King Herod to fund his building projects and Rome's armies and his banquets that they were always working and always hungry. These people had probably never sat down at a table before and gotten up full. They sat down at tables and got up when the food ran out. But not that day. Not that day. On that day, at that Jesus party, everyone ate until they were full. And still, there was an abundance left over. And all those broken pieces at Jesus' command, they were gathered up and they were saved, and we feed on them still. We invite everyone to follow Jesus with us, and Jesus' followers do what he asked them to do, and that was serve. And you all know how much I love to lose a few hours every week reading commentaries, and the people who write commentaries have all sorts of wonderfully interesting, creative things to say about this story, about these verses. The five loaves of bread represent the five books of Torah, and the seven items of food represent the seven virtues of faith, and the two fish represent the law and the prophets, which means, according to one guy, I kid you not, that we know the fish must have been cooked because the prophets were persecuted. And the scriptures are holy and true, and they are anointed, and they have so many layers and layers of revelation, and all of these meaning-filled metaphors and allegories have their place, have their truth, but don't miss the core truth of what happened. Don't miss here the pattern that we find for our life together. People came, there was a huge crowd. Jesus fed them real food, food that came from somewhere, food that belonged to his followers. And there was enough for everyone. There were even leftovers. That's the pattern of our serving with Jesus. And we're not always serving literal food but we always have to be open to serving in exactly that way. There is always a crowd around us. And like the disciples, we have to be able to see real needs. But let this story teach us that it's not our job to send people away to take care of themselves. It's not our call to be reasonable. And it's certainly, according to the story, not our call to decide who deserves to be there or who is there for the right reasons or who will understand and appreciate gifts or who is worth serving and only serve them. Herod invited people to a party and he also caused them to be fed. 
but he only invited people he thought were worthy. He only included people he thought were a good return on investment. He fed people, but he fed them so that they would owe him. He fed them to cement his power over them. He served them, but his serving was transactional, not ours. There are too many churches out here serving like Herod, including those who they believe will build their brand, including those who they believe have something to offer and appeasing people who, who they see as a threat. There are too many churches out here serving like Herod, dividing the crowd into allies and threats and people to use, dividing the crowd into people to impress and people to oppress. Well, we don't serve like Herod. We serve like Jesus which means whoever shows up, whoever we've invited and whoever else God sends along, we serve with whatever we have and we hold nothing back. We serve giving away what we have because we know that it wasn't ours anyway. And like Jesus, we don't distinguish between who we believe is worthy or unworthy and we don't give so that we will receive. Like Jesus, and please don't miss this church, we don't worry about being taken advantage of. We don't worry about being used. We give and we serve because that is the culture of the kingdom we have sworn allegiance to. We give because giving is our superpower, because we trust God to provide for us. See, Herod used his power to take, but Jesus and Jesus' followers use their power to give. We give like Jesus gave. So nobody can take advantage of us because our goal is to glorify God. And our goal is to bear witness to the culture of God's kingdom. And our witness isn't determined by how other people respond. Our witness is determined by how we give. The witness is in how we serve, not in what happens next. And I promise you that not everybody in that crowd began to follow Jesus after that. I promise you that there were people fed and healed in that crowd that day who ended up screaming, crucify him outside the walls of Jerusalem later. I promise you that there were people in that crowd who thought the disciples were suckers and losers. And those people still got fed because Jesus is the son of God who feeds people in the wilderness. And Jesus is the son of God who causes the rain to fall on the just and unjust. And Jesus is the son of God who causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus had compassion on everyone who was there, those who were there seeking God, and those who were there just desperately seeking relief wherever they might find it. No matter what their motivation was in being there, their stomachs were equally empty. And Jesus had the power to fill them, to serve them. And so he fed them all. And so must we. Jesus fed them all. Jesus used what his followers had. And our temptation is always going to be the temptation that the first disciples had. Our, our temptation is always going to be to send the crowd away to take care of themselves, to hold back what we have because what we have isn't even enough for ourselves. What we have isn't even enough to meet this need. So why do we have to give it up? We are always going to have the temptation to believe that if we had enough, we would definitely share. But since we don't, we'll keep it for ourselves. Since we can't feed the crowd anyway, we might as well keep our own lunch. And all I can say to that is, this story is about a miracle. About something that happened even though it couldn't have happened. It's about the power of God. That same power that spoke all of reality into existence, that power that made creation out of nothing, it's that same power intervening and making enough. And in our life together, that's not always going to look like everybody gets enough fish. Sometimes at our community meals, we run out of food, and when that happens, I get excited because it means that we have been faithful it means that we held nothing back. Church, it's not our job to make sure that, the, that there is enough. That's on God. 
it is our job to see the need of those in front of us, to reject our reasonable plans of action, to refrain from deciding who is and who isn't worthy of being served, and to take what we have, even when it's not enough, to take what we have, holding nothing back and giving it to the Lord. And also, as long as we're talking about serving, it needs to be said in this story, we see that the disciples, they served first and ate last. And that's how it's gotta be with us too at the Grove. And there's no risk in that posture because in our community to serve is honor and because we stake our lives on the truth of this story. And so there's no risk to that. People came and Jesus fed them real food, food he asked the disciples to give them and they served and they held nothing back. And when everyone was finished eating, even the disciples had had enough. Jesus taught them not to count the size of their gift. And in Jesus' hands, what they had became more than enough. We are inviting all to serve with us. Why? Because we live in a world that only knows how to throw one kind of party, where the powerful get fed and the powerless are killed. And most people are too scared to leave that story, but nobody loves it. Even Herod, the most powerful man in that room, he wasn't free at that party. But our Lord is a king of a different realm, and it is a realm that is breaking in and breaking up the current powers and principalities and also redeeming even the broken pieces. And we have the great joy of sharing the good news that there is a better story, an invitation into a better party, one where everyone is welcome, one where everyone gets fed, one where every gift is sacred and God, not us, provides the abundance. Friends, that's just a better story. It's just factually a better party. Nobody chooses to stay at the first banquet of fear and betrayal and death, not once they've been welcomed into the second banquet full of abundance and miracle bread and healing and joy. It's our delight to serve and invite others to be served and to serve with us because we know the power and presence of the one who is at the top of the table, King Jesus who heals and feeds his people. King Jesus, who is the bread of life. King Jesus, in him there is enough for everyone and an abundance left over. Alleluia. Amen.
and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. This salvation in your Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very life. the promised your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. And now, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace forever. Amen.